But we're not going to talk about design system anymore. We're going to talk about open source. And so let's going to kick it off with design is the future of open source. Hey, everyone. When I was given the opportunity to speak today, I wasn't quite sure what my angle was going to be at first. So I immediately started watching tons of TED Talks, which is pretty much the worst thing that you can do because you start to go into panic mode, thinking about how little you've accomplished in your time on this planet, how you never led an expedition to the North Pole or provided electricity to your village through sheer ingenuity. So I was binging on TED videos. I came across one talk by someone who I deeply admire. Mark Ronson is an award-winning music producer, the creative mind behind Amy Winehouse's seminal album, Back to Black, and mega hits like Bruno Mars' Uptown Funk and Lady Gaga's Million Reasons. And as it turns out, Mark Ronson is also a TED speaker. In his TED talk, How Sampling Transformed Music, Mark Ronson describes the industry's introduction to the digital sampler. He talks about the 1984 hip hop track, Ladi Dadi, which has been sampled in over 500 songs across a variety of genres by artists ranging from Biggie Smalls to Miley Cyrus. And Mark Ronson uses this as a way to highlight the cultural shift unlocked by this new technology. It's a fantastic talk. Here's what resonated most with me. Can you guys hear it? Apparently not. All right, we're going to have to do it live, huh? In this talk, Mark Ronson talks about how we live in the post-sampling era, that in the music industry, as a result of the digital sampler, we take the things that we love and we build on them, that this was the impact, the singular impact that the digital sampler had on music. Now, I believe that software design is on the cusp of a very similar transformation. My name is Saleo. Some of you know that I'm a software designer turned investor. But very few of you know that before I was a software designer, I was a musician. Here I am at age 10, shortly after I learned the violin and saxophone. I grew up playing in youth symphonies and bands, and eventually ended up studying music and composing music in college. Music has shaped who I am and how I see the world. And the story of how I pivoted from musician to designer starts with the central theme of Mark Ronson's TED Talk this profoundly human impulse to sample and remix the works of others. Now, one reason I'm excited to talk about open source today is I get to express, finally, after so many years, my gratitude to one lovely human being who had an extraordinary impact on my life. In 2004, a digital designer by the name of Joshua Davis decided he was going to take a bunch of his personal projects he had built in Macromedia Flash, put them on a CD-ROM, and they'll then sell copies of this disk on the internet. He called this project the PlayStation Hard Drive, and I was one of his earliest customers. When I opened the contents of the CD, I found a variety of interactive flash source files. They were unorganized, largely undocumented, like a snapshot of a folder from his Mac. Joshua Davis decided he would make his flash projects available to the public with the specific intent of allowing others to learn from his own creative output. That's it, simple premise. Now, I don't remember what I paid for that disk, but I am still seeing a return on the investment to this very day. The PlayStation CD-ROM was my introduction to coding for the web. It changed my life. I learned object-oriented programming, how to, code, uh, to, how to use code to animate graphics, and how to construct interactive experiences in media. I was absolutely hooked. My dubious career as a musician had come to a quick end. Why? all because Joshua Davis made it possible for people like me to resample his work, take what we love, and build on it. So rather than starting from scratch and building flash projects from a blank canvas, I was able to tweak and remix Davis's work to make it my own. I didn't know it at the time, but PlayStation was also my introduction to open source. It taught me firsthand the simple power of teaching by sharing. When most people think about open source, they imagine libraries of free code and hours and hours spent in front of a command line. But PlayStation provided me a glimpse of something a little bit more fundamental. So Joshua Davis, if you ever see this talk from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you. After becoming a self-taught developer and designer, 
I went on to build the early products and design teams at Facebook and later Dropbox. These days, I invest in new startups out of a seed fund called Combine, where I help the designers in our portfolio to navigate the sort of challenges I once faced. And today, I'm going to do what I think is one of the most reckless things you can do if you're an early stage investor in tech. I'm going to make a prediction about the future, and then I'm going to share it publicly. I'm doing this in the Joshua Davis spirit of putting some ideas out there into the world for others to consider and perhaps remix and make their own. My prediction? I believe that design is the future of open source. And to explain what I mean, I want you to travel back with me in time to the year 2005, when I first joined Facebook, and where I was introduced to the open software movement. Facebook at that time was a social network used by 5 million students in high schools and colleges all across America. The service was largely built on top of free open web technology. We used popular open source projects like Apache, PHP, MySQL, and Memcached to serve what was then just a website and to eventually scale it to millions more people as we expanded access to the network. Facebook's mission then was to make the world more open and connected. And our engineering team embraced this ethos by making a full-throated commitment to open source software. So not only did we rely on open source projects, but we contributed our own improvements to these projects based on our direct experience scaling Facebook. And whenever we built core infrastructure that didn't yet exist and that we felt might benefit other teams facing similar challenges, we open sourced those projects as well. Since its earliest history, Facebook has made key contributions to open infrastructure in the form of projects like Thrift, HPHP, and more recently, the wildly popular React, React Native, and GraphQL stacks. These projects are financed, created, and used by the company, but then made freely available for anyone to use, even Facebook's own competitors. Facebook believes that open knowledge and infrastructure can serve a much greater good, and this early commitment to open source benefited the company on several fronts. First, Facebook had access to affordable tech that was constantly being iterated upon and improved by the brightest minds all across the industry working on the frontiers of scaling consumer products, people we didn't even employ. Second, Facebook was able to showcase types of technical challenges our engineers tackled on a regular basis through these open source projects. Open source was a boon to end recruiting. And Facebook could offer its engineers the opportunity to make an industry-wide impact well beyond the company's commercial interests. This commitment to open source fundamentally shaped the way I think about finding and creating leverage. To get a sense of where open source is headed, we need to first understand how we got here. And that story is impossible to tell without GitHub. In 2008, the advent of GitHub, a code sharing platform, created a step change in open source software. Up until then, version control software already existed so that software teams could collaborate on code repositories. But what GitHub introduced for the first time was the ability for people to share and discover projects across teams and companies. Developers can now easily sample, remix, and contribute to open source projects by people they had not even met. GitHub's impact on the world today cannot be overstated. GitHub created the right combination of tools, people, and distribution for open source projects to flourish and ultimately find entirely new use cases all over the planet. It's this aspect of open source that perhaps most resembles the post-sampling world of music Mark Ronson talked about. The digital sampler enabled Miley Cyrus and Biggie Smalls to produce their respective takes on Lottie Dottie. You don't even have to like either of them. Yet both songs can coexist because they scratch different itches than the original songwriter Slick Rick set out to scratch. So when you fast forward to now, you'll find that open source software sits at the very center of virtually every single company. Startups like Figma are even built on top of open source tech stacks. Here's an overview of some of the open source projects that Figma relies upon to serve its product to you. Popular open source projects are even becoming a new category of distribution. For example, the cloud computing startup Zite uses its open JavaScript framework Next.js to generate demand for its commercial products. Developers have created Next.js projects by the millions. And when they look for the best continuous integration provider to deploy their work, guess which product they prefer? 
the one built by the team behind Next.js, Site Now. The end result? 33% of all Next.js projects in the wild live on Zite Now. They are the top product in the market. Open source is a new distribution channel. The impact on talent markets has also been profound. Employers often cite GitHub as a key data source for identifying and qualifying talent. Developers residing far outside of key markets are often found through projects and contributions on GitHub. Today, GitHub stars can count as much as a degree from Stanford. And as such, we've seen a massive influx in human talent into the field of software engineering. This is in large part due to the affordable self-learning opportunities that the GitHub ecosystem and community of open source developers have made possible. As knowledge markets work, grow, and software continues to eat the world, open source is where industry-wide impact can be made. But some of you are probably asking, Saleo, what does this have to do with design? And to explain, we need to start with a common definition for software design. For this definition, I will look, I will turn to the writing of someone else I admire. He's another designer turned investor who you should all know. Mitch Kapoor was the founder of Lotus Software and the creator of Lotus 123, the spreadsheet standard that dominated the market throughout the 80s and well into the 90s. Those of you who recognize Mitch likely also regard him as I do, as a founding father of software design. Why? Well, back in 1989, he wrote a famous manifesto on software design, and in doing so, he coined the term. In it, Mitch goes into great detail describing the guerrilla existence of a designer at a software company. Probably sounds familiar to many of you. And the nature of the work one must do in what was then a new and emergent role. All of you should read this manifesto. It begins with the ancient question, what is design? What makes something a design problem? It's where you stand with a foot in two worlds, the world of technology and the world of people and human purposes, and you try to bring those two together. Software design is not the same as user interface design. Mitch then goes on to clarify a common misunderstanding he encountered in early software teams. The overall design of a program is to be clearly distinguished from the design of its user interface. If a user interface is designed after the fact, that is like designing an automobile's dashboard after the engine, chases, and all the other components and functions are specified. The software designer is concerned primarily with the overall conception of the product. Mitch Kapoor then goes on to provide a specific example to crystallize what software design is. Dan Brinkland's invention of the electronic spreadsheet is one of the crowning achievements of software design. It is the metaphor of the spreadsheet itself, its tableau of rows and columns with the precisely labeled numbers and formulas, rather than the user interface of VisiCalc, for which he will be remembered. The look and feel of a product is but one part of its design. I want to key in on Mitch's example of the spreadsheet. Now, mind you, he made this observation over 30 years ago. And ever since Mitch penned his manifesto, we've watched the personal computing industry utterly transform society, in large part due to the crowning achievement that the spreadsheet did in fact turn out to be. Over the course of three decades and multiple tech cycles, the electronic spreadsheet has transformed how millions of businesses operate worldwide. It's changed the sorts of questions we can ask, the information that drives major economic decisions, both local and macro and how we forecast and model out a vast spectrum of scenarios. And over that same time period, much as Mitch predicted, we've watched the spreadsheet's interface design evolve across countless versions of Microsoft Excel, and further still with modern products like Quip, Airtable, and Google Sheets. The spreadsheet today exists across multiple products that serve vastly new markets, work on radically new devices, and address an entire universe of new use cases use cases that the spreadsheet's creator could have never imagined. I want to talk about one such use case. It is the kernel for this entire talk. It's certainly one that Dan Bricklin could never have envisioned. And it provides a potent example of what I think open source might look like if you made it accessible to more people than just those who can code. 
In the fall of 2017, during the rise of the Me Too movement, a Google spreadsheet was created by Moira Donegan, a former assistant editor at the New Republic. In it, she began to organize claims of sexual misconduct committed by men in the media industry. Moira shared this Google sheet, dubbed the Shitty Men and Media List, privately with a few female colleagues. The spreadsheet allowed them to anonymously contribute warnings and to confirm their own experiences with some of the men named. Much of what was documented had previously gone unreported and was being brought to light for the first time. This spreadsheet was then shared with more women working in the media industry, and they in turn provided their lived experiences and added more names and invited more colleagues. This process repeated itself until mere hours later, more than 70 men were named as perpetrators of sexual crimes and misconduct, some of them associated with the most prestigious outlets in media. As the spreadsheet gathered more contributors, it quickly went viral, went ultimately public, and was reported upon by the press. And it went on to have a seismic effect on the Me Too movement at large. The SMM spreadsheet became a resource for thousands. It was an agent of change. And like any piece of open source technology that disrupts the status quo, it stirred a passionate debate and inspired similar efforts. The right combination of tool, people, and distribution demonstrated the power to kick off investigations and in some cases, create justice and cultural reform. I think at this point, it's important to highlight that this spreadsheet success was by design. When I read about it, I was just absolutely amazed. The SMM list was a glimpse of, of what open source might evolve into. Again, provided that we make tools and systems accessible to more than just people who can program. It was also a striking example of how the design of the spreadsheet metaphor alone was not enough to instigate real change. So to be precise, Dan Bricklin on the left did not design the SMM list. It took a Moira Donegan to design a mechanism that ultimately helped fuel a movement. And perhaps more fundamentally, this case study strikes at one of the big questions at the heart of all things related to software. I think it might perhaps be the biggest question of all the question of our age, the question of who has power and why. So with all this as pretext, here's why I think design is the future of open source and what this means in practice. In the next decade, knowledge work will finally transition from single player apps designed for individuals to shared environments designed for groups of people. Workflows, states, and processes will increasingly reside at a team level context. We are already seeing this evolution today in the form of modern multiplayer products like Figma and Dropbox Paper. This presents a unique opportunity to software designers who think and act like the open source developers of yesteryear. Just as open source software inspired great engineers to build novel abstractions, tools, and resources for other developers around the world to use, so too will open source designers set out to solve challenges shared by teams of other designers across our industry. Today, access to the benefits of open source is largely limited by the tools we provide people. I believe, like many founders working in a no-code startup, that new tools can and they must exist to expand access to technology beyond the small sliver of the population who can program. The next GitHub-like platform will reward software designers with both prestige and a new form of distribution through the work that they open source. And I believe the most lasting contributions in software design the ones that stand the test of time, like Dan Bricklin's work on the spreadsheet and Moira Donegan's work on social justice, will be made by people who ultimately strive to broaden access to technology and empower more people. If I had to guess, these projects will resemble la di dadi in how easy they are to sample, remix, and apply to entirely new use cases all over the planet. So these are the questions I hope you take away from this talk. Joshua Davis recognized the power of open source and a self-serve education. To a young musician who never considered a career designing software, PlayStation was a message of empowerment. The designers of tomorrow must look beyond their employer's objectives and product roadmap to tackle more leveraged problems affecting human society. This is the only way we flourish. We must broaden access to technology and design. Because if we don't do this, we can only expect to see over time 
the further concentration of power to few, rather than the expansion of power to all. Most people think of design in the form of a noun. Design is like an object, a trade, a profession, something you can hold. Sometimes people talk about design as if it were a cult or some mysterious craft. My hope for the coming decade is that we transition away from this old mindset of design as a noun towards acknowledging that design is also a verb, that design is not something you possess, it is something you do, and that like most human activities, anyone can design, no matter their prior knowledge or circumstances. This will require new technology, again, the right tools, people, and distribution. I will leave with you as a parting thought, the words of another musician who I deeply admire. This person once said that all humans are musical. They just need to be exposed to the right environment and support to express their musicality. This was a very contrarian viewpoint in the mid-20th century. Conventional wisdom back then said that only some people possessed innate musical talent. This person is now known for creating a musical training method he designed from this philosophy. It has taught millions of children all over the world, including myself, how to play the violin, but more importantly, how to be musical. Today we know this as a Suzuki method, named after its designer. It aims to create an environment for learning music which parallels the linguistic environment of acquiring a native language, and it derives from this philosophy. I have come to the definite conclusion that musical ability is not an inborn talent, but an ability which can be developed and so too it is with design. It will be up to us to make the world so. Thank you.